Welcome to Clickhole Wednesday, a casual hump day hangout that takes less time to edit than my other shit. Hello pepperonis and gentlemen, welcome back to another Clickhole in your long-term goal of being a Jeopardy master. We'll be starting with a random article on Wikipedia and clicking our way down the path of more random articles. God, my descriptions are getting more and more scintillating every week. Right, let's get started. Here we go, random article. Cacophony Society, founded in 1986 and preceded by the Suicide Club. What on earth is this? Oh, the headquarters are in San Francisco, no surprise there. All right, the Cacophony Society is a randomly gathered network of free spirits united in the pursuit of experiences beyond the pale of mainstream society. This is gonna be exciting. It was started in 1986 by surviving members of the now defunct Suicide Club. What do they mean by surviving members? What did the Suicide Club actually do? And despite its name, the club wasn't actually about suicide. Focused on people facing their fears. Okay, wow, well apparently select members survived. Not all of them. Cacophony has been described as indirect culture jamming outgrowth of the Dada movement. Culture jamming? Protest used by many anti-consumerist social movements to disrupt or subvert media culture and its mainstream cultural institutions, including corporate advertising. Interesting, okay. According to self-designated members of the society, you may already be a member. It's never too late to discover the secret clubs you're a part of. The anarchic nature of the society means that membership is left open-ended, and anyone may sponsor an event, though not every idea pitched garners attendance by members. Events involve costumes and pranks in the public, sometimes in places that are off-limits. Cacophonists have been known to regale Christmas shoppers with improvised Christmas carols while dressed as Santa Claus. Well, that sounds, that sounds particularly wholesome. I mean, that's just Christmas carolers in a shop. Oh, but the carols are improvised. Okay, so may maybe they're singing something naughty. Members of Cacophony Society's first group also became the primary organizers of Burning Man. Oh, okay. Now, now I'm understanding the um, segment of society that is operating here. So they were burning some effigies and other events they've created are the Atomic Cafe, Chinese New Year Treasure Hunt, Picnic on the Golden Gate Bridge, driving an earthquake damaged car to commemorate the 1989 earthquake, and some other stuff. Looks like the group kind of died out though. Meanwhile, the Los Angeles chapter um, finished in late 2000 when longtime leader Reverend Al did the ultimate art form and pranked the society itself, declaring a bold new direction and joining an orthodox Christian community out of guilt of the deaths of two young cacophonists who reportedly died in a drunken post-event car accident, though one of them turned out to be completely fake and the other was discovered quite some months later alive and well amused at the tumult at resulting from his death. <laughs> oh, but then he actually died a few years later. That's a bit sad. <laughs> In 1993, the Seattle chapter held a protest event called Uncan the Cranberries at a shopping mall, where Cacophony members asked the public to save the free range cranberry. Another Cacophony member asked the adult children of parents to avoid a dysfunctionality and substance abuse by staying home and avoiding family gatherings. Honestly, I'm kind, I'm kind of a fan of the Cacophony Society. Some of this stuff's funny as hell. By the mid-90s, it spread to Portland. Things are gonna get weird now. They hosted the infamous first Naughty Santa Rampage. It was a plane load of Santas, and they were met by Portland's police in riot gear. Swift, thoughtful, and very friendly action by Santa Melmoth, whatever that means, inviting the nice police along for the fun kept confrontations to a minimum. The weekend resulted in only one arrest. Wow, that's actually impressive. I thought it was gonna I thought it was gonna go down. Santa's versus riot gear cops. And it involved a gift wrapped in a Playboy centerfold given to someone without checking the recipient's ID to make sure he was over 18. Oh my god. Yes, because no no young man under the age of 18 has ever looked at a naked lady. That would never happen in this wholesome world we live in. Other favorite events include Stripper Bingo. Oh, they own SantaCon. Oh, it's making sense now. I thought about SantaCon when uh, brought up the Naughty Santa Rampage. Basically, it's a giant city-wide pub crawl where you dress up as Santa. So what the heck is the Suicide Club? Thank God my channel's not monetized. 
It was a secret society in San Francisco, which lasted about five years, 70s to early 80s. It is credited as the first modern extreme urban exploration society, and they did pranks. The club focused on people facing their fears and engaging in daring experiences. Okay, so the first suicide club event occurred on January 2nd, 1977, during a winter rainstorm in San Francisco. And they met up under the Golden Gate Bridge, at the top of a wall facing the Pacific Ocean. The waves from the storm were crashing on the rocks below the wall, then going up the wall, and then crashing on top of the wall, soaking the four people at the top. So they took turns facing certain death by running up and holding onto the chain while the waves crashed down on them. If a person let go of the chain or was knocked unconscious, then they would likely be swept out to sea. After surviving the ordeal, the founder started the sewer cl side club. Why would you do this? Like, I can't, I can't think of a situation where you would tell this story of something you decided to do and somebody would go, yeah, that sounds really fun, that sounds cool, that's edgy. I understand that it's technically edgy, but why would you bother? I don't know. The club became public in spring 1977 as a course that Warren, the founder, Gary Warren, taught at the Communiversity which was part of the free school movement and formerly a part of San Francisco State. And it lasted until shortly before his death in 1983. Oh, wonder how he died. Hopefully it wasn't one of these wild attempts. The goal was to have a disconnect with reality and a connection with super reality. And apparently getting naked on the cable cars was a mode of that transport, I guess. Here we go, activities. The club's monthly mailer was called the noose letter. Clever. Street theatre and pranks, such as the naked cable car riding and making postcards commemorating it. Elaborate games in odd locales, such as cemeteries and sewer tunnels. Explorations, urban and otherwise, like abandoned buildings and bridges. Infiltrations, the Unification Church and the American Nazi Party, with the two most daring and involved. Ooh. Suicide Club was best known at the time for its bridge climbing exploits, and then it became the Cacophony Society. Okay, well now you know about this very strange counterculture movement and the club it became. Pretty crazy. I understand what they're trying to do with disconnect with reality and connection to super reality, because the knowledge that you could die in a situation is a super real feeling. But do we want to feel that? I don't know that that's something I desire. There are other ways to feel connected with reality, but okay. Each to his own. Some people need more excitement than others. Let's go to secret society. Maybe there's a list of other secret societies. God, that's a, there's a lot of secret societies. I guess they're not so secret. Singapore gets its own page. Wait, the International Debutante Bowl is listed under Secret Society? Is that technically a secret society? It's just weird. It's just creepy. It's just the way rich people sell off their daughters. It's disgusting. There's also the Order of the Star Spangled Banner to protest the rise of the Irish, Catholic, and German immigration. Wow, people will make a group out of anything. Let's, um, let's explore secret societies in Singapore. I want to know... Oh, they've been eradicated. What? They have been largely eradicated as a security issue in the city-state. However, many smaller groups remain today which attempt to mimic societies of the past. Despite fading from contemporary, contemporary Singaporean society, these secret societies hold great relevance to Singapore's modern history. The founding of the city-state in 1819 saw the arrival of thousands of Chinese, thereby transplanting to Singapore social systems already present in China itself. Although the secret societies were commonly associated with violence, extortion, and vice, they also played a part in building a social fabric for early Chinese migrants in Singapore. They were given leeway to control the Chinese populace due to the hands-off policy adopted by the British colonials, who hope to create stability. Interesting. So they were sort of tolerated because they created some kind of order. A bit like the Yakuza, I think. I think Japanese government tolerates the Yakuza, which is like the Japanese mafia, because to a degree it keeps some kind of order. Maybe not tolerate. I don't know what the legal term is, but there's, there's something about why they let them sort of run business. Maybe they're involved, who knows? Well, there isn't a list of secret societies, so I'm a bit disappointed. Ah Kong, one of the world's largest drug syndicates. Yeah, let's have a look at that. Ah Kong was an organized crime and drug syndicate that used to control the European heroin trade in the 1970s to 1990s. It was one of the world's largest drug syndicates with its origin from Singapore, but was based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and Bangkok, Thailand, where they received their drug supplies. The production of heroin was at an area known as the Golden Triangle, formed by Thailand, Laos, and Myanmar. Ah Kong was not a triad, but a fearsome organized crime gang that was 
renowned all over Asia and Europe. Only hundreds of members though, that's quite tight for a established organised crime syndicate. They lost their influence to another gang after the assassination of their boss in 1997. Ah, but the last official Ah Kong boss died in 2010. That's actually quite recent. So the reason it started was because in 1969, Roland and 10 of his fellow gang members armed themselves with machetes and attacked um, two members of a rival gang. One of the rival gang members was killed and the other was seriously injured. They then held negotiations to settle the dispute, but it broke down. So they issued a curfew between the two gangs where basically they would just attack each other on sight. I don't know how that's a curfew, but that's what's written. So obviously Roland and some of his fellow gang members wanted to escape. So they escaped to Malaysia and then made it to Amsterdam. Most of the gang members involved in the attack were arrested and jailed without trial, but he made it out. So then suddenly he was in Amsterdam and I guess they started up. At the time, Holland had a very relaxed attitudes towards drugs and it encouraged foreign narcotics merchants to move into the country. Dutch law made it extremely difficult for police to cope with all the narcotics traffic. Oh, so he actually had family there already. So he arrived with many connections because of Johnny, or Big Johnny, who is the godson of his mother, and they started a thriving drug trade. Within four years of that initial fight, they became a major player in heroin. Ooh, this is, this is long and detailed. God, the Italian Mafia were involved, a Yugoslav Yugoslavian crime syndicate was involved. This was a very international operation. Russians, Zurich, Dutch drug lords, the Hong Kong police, Vietnamese people, Hell's Angels in Denmark. Oh, the Hell's Angels in Denmark um, had parties at one of Roland's restaurants in Copenhagen. Dang, this guy was everywhere. Interesting that I don't think he has a... Does he have a Wikipedia page? Nope, nothing. Interesting. What the hell is the Hell's Angels Wikipedia page like? I don't even know. I wonder what they say. A worldwide one percenter motorcycle club. Yes, whose members typically ride Harleys. One percenter, what does that mean? Outlaw motorcycle club, is that what that means? Okay. Motto, angels forever, forever angels is the traditional one. An unspecific one percenter saying is when we do it right, nobody remembers. When we do wrong, nobody forgets. That's true. They have been used as security at concerts and sometimes that's gone really well and other times it has not and I guarantee most people remember <laughs> the times it did not go well. Netherlands was the first country to completely ban the Hells Angels. Last year, 2019. Other countries such as Germany have banned local chapters but never the entire club. Wow, the DOJ considers the club to be an organized crime syndicate. I don't know, it's kind of funny. I mean, obviously they've done a lot of bad things but I've seen them quite frequently. <laughs> so I'm sort of like, oh God, are they are organized crime? Right, yes, I guess so. They were founded in 1948 in California when several small motorcycle clubs agreed to merge. Their website notes that the name was first suggested by an associate of the founders named Arvid Olsen, who had served in the Hells Angels squadron of the Flying Tigers in China during World War II. According to the Hells Angels website, they are aware that an apostrophe is missing in Hells, but state that it is you who miss it, we don't. No fucks given, everybody. Hells Angels have run out of fucks to give about their forgotten apostrophe. There's a whole article for their criminal allegations and incidents. Well, they've sued a lot of people for intellectual property rights. Cool, they must have money. I wonder how much money is in the Hells Angels. All right, in order to become a Hells Angels prospect, you must have a valid driver's license, a motorcycle over 750cc, and have the right combination of personal qualities. You cannot be a child molester, and you cannot be somebody who's applied to be a police or a prison officer. I love that they throw child molesters in with people who've applied to be cops or prison officers. <laughs> to the Hells Angels, those are equally bad. You've done equal damage to society. After a lengthy phased process, a prospective member is first deemed to be a hangaround, indicating that the individual is invited to some club events or to meet club members at known gathering places. If hangaround is interested, he may ask to become an associate, a status that usually lasts a year or two. At the end of that stage, you're reclassified as prospect, you participate in some club activities, but you don't have voting privileges. The last phase and highest membership status is full membership or full patch. So, in order to become a full member, you must be voted on unanimously by the rest of the full club members. Prior to votes being cast, a prospect usually travels to every charter in the sponsoring charter's geographic jurisdiction by motorcycle, I assume, 
and introduces himself to every full patch member. They can ask any questions prior to the vote and some form of formal induction follows. And then you get the final logo patch at the initiation ceremony. Even after a member is patched in, the patches themselves remain the property of Hell's Angels. If you leave the Hell's Angels or are ejected, you must return the patches. You're allowed to leave. That's interesting for an organized crime syndicate. You're not typically allowed to leave those, but they're progressive, I guess. Hey, George Harrison of the Beatles was hanging out with some of the San Francisco Hells Angels. Club is not officially a racially segregated organization, but at least one charter requires that a candidate be a white male. One of them stated in an interview that the club as a whole is not racist, but we probably have enough racist members that no black guy is going to get in it. I feel like there should be some more ju juicy details here. I feel like there's some interesting things going on. Let's see the list of criminal allegations and incidents. Let's see how long it is. Oh my god. I'm just gonna keep scrolling. I'm just gonna keep scrolling until we get to the bottom. I mean, this is this is an obscene. This this is why they're considered an organized crime syndicate. Even though you see that. Oh, we're down to the uh, notes. That's a lot. Down by state and country. God, they really are everywhere. Let's see. Let's pick a random state. Let's see what they've been up to in Nebraska. Oh boy. Oh, it's a long. Oh, it's a long one. Why did I pick Nebraska? Okay. Jeez. I'm just picking up keywords. Bodies, shot and killed, conspiracy, torture. Ooh, under three year undercover investigation. My God, this is extensive. Okay, well, um, there's some light reading for you, is the criminal allegations of the Hells Angels. Casually, the allies are all Nazis, mafia families, and giant cartels. Wow. Oh no, Hell's Angels aren't friends with the Sons of Satan. Oh, isn't that a shame? That would have been a match made in hell. <laughs> the Australian Hell's Angels have aligned themselves with the Coffin Cheaters. What a name. Okay, how the heck do I get out of this? I have no idea. Let's check out Canadian crime. Gangs in Toronto. Ooh, that's quite a number. Big Circle Gang. Big Circle Boys. Interesting. There's an Albanian mafia in Canada? Weird. Gangs in Canada. Let's go even broader. Satan's Choice Motorcycle Club. That sounds almost high class. Like premium motorcycle club of Satan. There's a gang of pimps called North Preston's Finest in Nova Scotia. African Canadians. How bizarre. Yep, they traffic children and women. Lovely. North Preston's finest. Certainly doesn't seem like it. Oh, help. How do I get out of prostitution and organized crime? Why do I end up in these dark corners of Wikipedia? Let's get out entirely and click on North Preston. What's it like? Why are there so many pimps? Community traces its origins for several, from several waves of migration in the 18th and 19th centuries. The American Revolution brought black loyalists to the Preston area. Oh, interesting. They crossed the border to get away from all our shit. 1790s brought a different group of black settlers to the regions, the Maroons from Jamaica. While many Maroons later left for Sierra Leone, a number stayed in Preston. Then there were black refugees from the War of 1812. Inter that's actually an interesting migration story. Has a high home ownership rate and a stable population. It resisted gentrification. It's quite rural though. God, it's very rural. Population is somewhere between 805 and 4,100. Let's check out the Canada portal. Oh, look at this. Big Chungus, a North American beaver. Oh, it's the Canadian national symbol. Did I know that? I don't think I did. That is a winning national symbol right there. Big Chungus, symbol of Canada. Apparently Canada's answer to Billie Eilish is 16 year old Tate McRae. Let's look at Tate McRae. Good God, to me, if you are born in 2003, I still think you're seven. That's just how you're gonna be. You're gonna be seven forever, Tate. But no, she's a year off being an adult. Jesus Christ, time flies. There she is. Yeah, I'm getting Billie Eilish vibes a bit. Just normal colored hair. See, she was born in Calgary to a Canadian father of Scottish and Omani descent and a German mother. Oh, at four, she moved with her family to Oman where her mother taught dance lessons. She began doing ballet at six and dancing competitively back in Canada. That's a very interesting early life. She has 2.8 million subscribers on her YouTube channel. <sighs> She's only got a few more than I do. Just, just a few. Small handful. At the age of 13, she was the first Canadian finalist on the American TV show So You Think You Can Dance. 
Interesting she made it as a singer primarily though, even though dancing seems to be her first love. I have no idea what her music sounds like. Maybe it's terrible. Maybe it's amazing. She did a voice for a film called La La Oopsies. A so magical tale. La La Oopsie Ponies. The heck is La 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 Loopsie? Bet it looks like a nightmare. There are no pictures, that's how you'll know it's a nightmare. It follows a group of colourful ragdolls and their adventures in La La Loopsie Land. Why did I click on this? I have no idea. The genre is slice of life? That's a genre? Let's see. Oh, depiction of mundane experiences in art and entertainment. I didn't realise that's actually a genre. In theatre, slice of life refers to naturalism, while in literary parlance it is a narrative technique in which a seemingly arbitrary sequence of events in a character's life is presented, often lacking plot development, conflict and exposition, as well as having an open ending. Oh, that's kind of like, um... Uh, whatchamacallit, uh, Rilakkuma and Kaoru is a little bit slice of life, I think. It's not listed here. Oh, Seinfeld. Really? A work that focuses on minute and faithful reproduction of some bit of reality, without selection, organisation or judgement, and that every smallest detail is presented with scientific fidelity is an example of the slice of life novel. In anime and manga, slice of life is a genre that is more akin to melodrama than drama, bordering on absurd due to the large numbers of dramatic and comedic events in very short spans. The author compares it to teen drama such as Dawson's Creek or The O.C. Oh, so just like like teen teen dramas. Yeah, I guess it's a very popular, um, that's a very, very popular genre, to be honest. I don't know why I judged it. I guess it seemed foreign to me at first, but now it totally makes sense. Mumblecore? The heck is mumblecore? A subgenre of independent film, characterised by naturalistic acting and dialogue, sometimes improvised. Low budget film production, an emphasis on dialogue of a plot, and a focus of personal relationships of people in their 20s and 30s. <laughs> the term mumblecore has been used for films mixing the mumblecore and horror genres. I don't know any of these names. Oh, Greta Gerwig sounds familiar. Didn't she win something? I think she won an Oscar for something. Oh, and Lena Dunham, okay. Some critics have stated that Mumblecore ended around 2010, as the original crop of directors began making films with larger budgets. Oh, money ruins everything. That's the end of Mumblecore, it's money. Apparently Magic Mike and Magic Mike XXL have been described as having Mumblecore elements. That seems like I don't understand Mumblecore very well, because that seems like I would not categorise those as anything sounding like Mumblecore. It's not strictly an American phenomenon. The Berlin Mumblecore movement had its own manifesto. It is not a reaction to the American hype so much as it so much as it is a reaction to the lack of reform in a German public financial support system for the film industry. That's deep. List of Mumblecore films and television series. Do I know any of these? No. Do you know any of these? I definitely don't. Not a single one. There is a mumble gore film called Frozen. Probably not the Disney one. Yeah, well, I think this is a safe place to end this. We started with seedy and controversial topics, such as the Cacophony Society, Suicide Club, and Biker Gangs, somehow ended up on Mumblecore. That, that really is a 180. We took a brief detour to Canada, where we explored North Preston, and Canada's answer to Billie Eilish, and a strange TV series she had to voice in about ragdolls. I, I'm bewildered. Very strange. Anyway, if you learned something new in this click hole, please leave a comment. Let me know what you learned. Drop a like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for spending some time here with me. Always glad to have you around. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.